in the Cosmos, we have two main token types. The first one being native and the other being CW20 tokens. CW20 tokens are like ERC20 tokens in the fact that they are smart contract based, but a lot more focus is going on to native tokens due to their ease of use for developers as well as users. So here we can see on Juno Network a query for all of the bank's module native tokens through the total. We can see here that everything is in integers and they all have a denomination name. Because this chain also has the token factory module, it allows for any developer to create a namespace token to match what they desire. So in this case, we have a token for Joel, we have one for myself, we have one for this web app. So there's different applications you can have there, and that way that you can create a token specific to you, and even if the name is already taken up, you can still use that because these, these namespaces cannot collide for a native token. We can also see the amounts that don't have floating point numbers as we scroll through this long list. We can just see that these are all integers. Uh, they're actually unsigned integers here. They're just re represented as a string in the query. So here we have an unsigned integer, and the question becomes, how do I send a small amount of a token to a user? So maybe a user only wants to send half of a, a Juno or an Atom to, to another user. And the way that that's done is by converting from a developer-based token to the, what the user actually interacts with on the front end. So whenever a user has one token in their wallet, they actually have a million underneath the hood as a U token. In this case, U is the prefix for micro, which is 10 to the sixth power. So if I wanted to send another user one token, I would actually be sending them one million of the U token. Other examples of this are N, which stands for nano. This is 10 to the ninth power. And then we also have A, which is addo, and that is 10 to the 18th power, and this is what Ethereum uses. So Cosmos uses 10 to the sixth power. This is smaller, this is more manageable. We don't really see a need to, to go past that, but uh, the Ethereum side has more ability there. And if you wanted to do that in Cosmos, you can with the Ethermint project. So here we have all these tokens, and what are the real benefits and differences between native and CW20s? So with native, it works natively within the, the CLI. So if I wanted to send tokens, I can do that very easily by typing in that I want to bank send a token, and I can do that here. With a smart contract, you would need to have Cosm Wasm enabled on the chain for you know, smart contract interactions. You'd have to then do a Wasm execute, pass through JSON, and then allow that, that to go through. So it's a little bit more work. You need to understand the contract address rather than just having the tokens in your account here. It's also it's easier from an airdropping point of view where you can just export that state from the node that, that you run. So that makes it a lot easier there as all of this is saved natively within the state. So from queries to transactions to interacting with contracts is a lot easier as well as you can add that, you can append that amount as you execute against a contract. And then that contract can take those funds perform some action on it, make sure you either send enough or maybe you didn't and it can air out and those funds are still in your account afterwards. So you don't have that, that risk there. And so it's a, it's a great solution compared to CW20 and we're seeing more adoption and usage of the factory module because of this and native tokens as a whole. Here we have a CW20 base token. In this instance, it is Raccoon. What this contract is, is it's an address and a database of the numbers of how many tokens the user owns within within it. So here we can see the, the contract address. This is where all executes and queries will happen to to get this. So it's not as elegant as the bank solution, which allows a single query to grab all tokens. With this, you have to know the contract address beforehand to then push that over. Here in a UI such as Mintscan, you can see all contracts which are, are currently owning that token as well as the amount. So they do index this on their side, but as a normal user, you can't easily index this without uh, you know, querying the contract every single block and then following all of those transactions through. That's a much easier to do with the native tokens and not as easy to do with CW20s. And then here also within the UI, you can see what's actually being done on this contract. If you're interested in using a CW20, you can find this in the Cosm Wasm CW Plus repository, which includes the spec as well as how to, to compile it and upload it to a chain. Finally, here we have the migration. So if you have created a CW20 in the past, you may want to migrate it to a native token that you control as well. And so with this, these contracts here in the Cosmos Contracts Token Factory Contracts repo done by Juno, you're able to easily migrate from a CW20 that you have either created now or in the past, and then allow a one-to-one -one bi-directional change over to the, the new token factory denomination. And it has the documentation here, how to upload it, 
the store keys, etc. So all of that is, is done with it, within this. So it is possible to, to migrate between the two. Now here's some examples more of the, the Raccoon contract. So we can see here that we're going to query that contract address that we saw on the MintScan UI, and it's going to return back some of the information, such as the who is the admin of this contract. In this case, there is no admin, so no one can actually migrate the, the contract other than chain governance. We can see here a store code ID, which is just what is the ID of the bytes that we have created from to, in, to validate that this is indeed a CW20. You could also upload your own and use that, that code ID as well to guarantee that that really is a CW20. You can see when it's created, who the creator is, so you can make sure that you know the creator was actually who you expected it to be. And then there's some other information here, such as the label and then IBC ports IDs, if it is an IBC connected contract. Here we can actually check out a query where we're gonna check out the token info of the CW20. So again, this is that same address that we just saw and it's gonna return back some useful data, such as how many decimals is it? How U is micro, we know that that is 10 to the sixth power. We can see that there's six decimals here, so this is standard Cosmos contract. We can see here the name, the symbol, which in this case would be like dollar sign rack, and then what the total supply is of this token. And that is done via this JSON query, which is token info. You can find other information on what queries are available by actually removing some of the data, it being an invalid query, and it will return all of the different queries that is actually possible on this contract. So downloading the logo, marketing info, getting all accounts, allowances, etc. Finally here, we actually query some user tokens. As you can see, a smart contract can actually hold a balance of a CW20 as well. So you can tell a smart contract from a user account by the length of the, the total the total size of the wallet. In this instance, you can see that this is much longer than a standard user wallet. So we know that we're querying a smart contract here, and this is also another smart contract, and it does have this balance. To calculate this balance, you would take this and divide it by 10 to the power of six, which is 1 million, and that will give you the human readable form of how many tokens is actually held. And that's the same case for a user balance that is stored within this contract. You would take this number, divide it by a million. Now you have how many actual rack are there. If you just wanted this number, this is the URAC variant of that.